What's up, everybody? Ginger and Jeremy here. We're back for another episode. Yeah, excited to be back. And today we want to pick up a topic uh, looking at purity culture, mm -hmm. which was a movement that we'll talk about, you know, that rejected dating. And you and I both experienced it growing up. Yeah, we did. It was interesting. I think in different ways, right? Like yeah. mine was probably a little like, I don't know, maybe more intense mm -hmm. than yours, but um, you still experienced that some as well. So I actually think it would be helpful maybe if we just define like what is purity culture. Do you want to define that for us? Yeah, it, I, purity culture, I think a lot of our listeners will be familiar with it if they grew up mm -hmm. in kind of an evangelical Christian home in America. But in the early 90s, I think there was a reaction to the sexual revolution that had started sort of in the 60s in this country. And there was a real push for purity, which is a good thing. Um, but this purity culture emphasized a rejection of dating. So it mm -hmm. looked at cultural dating as, as negative and rejected that basically entirely. Replaced it with a concept called courtship or courting. Mm -hmm. um, and really promoted uh, young people who are getting to know each other in romantic relationships to pursue purity and so it formed its own culture. There was a book written by a, a guy named Joshua Harris called I Kissed Dating Goodbye mm -hmm. in, a few years later in the later 90s that was very influential and really took a lot of churches and church cultures by storm um, with young people uh, saying, okay, I'm, we're going to reject dating. We're not going to date. We're going to do relationships in a different way. And so, um, yeah, a lot went into it. Um, uh, you saw the rise of, you know, commitments to singleness or like giving the Lord a five-year commitment to singleness mm -hmm. or for purity. Um, there was uh, a lot of events, you know, because uh, if, if dating was rejected, how are young people going to get to know each other? So churches would put on a lot of events, yeah. uh, like purity events where you'd come and get to know each other. Did you ever attend something like that? No, I didn't, but I heard about them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't either. I, I heard about them as well, though. They would have these like conferences or retreats where it was like a singles conference and mm -hmm. all these single people would go listen to preaching for two or three days and find their soulmate and find their soulmate <laughs> and yeah. i remember some of my cousins going to those oh that's crazy because and they were they were you know harmless in the sense of i think churches were really trying to do a good job yeah, and say to like get christians together yeah have how do them we like meet each other it's kind of like a Christian mingle, I guess, but it's like in person. Yes. So wow, I didn't it's even not think bad. About that. It's not bad. Hey, so <laughs> I know I have two marriages in that that guys from my church uh, met on Christian mingle, met yeah. their wives on Christian yep. mingle, and are now married and happy and have kids. Yeah. And so that ain't bad. But <laughs> maybe we'll talk about some Christian mingle. Um, I had so when I was in New York playing with the Red Bulls, one of my roommates pranked me. Oh you remember this? Yes. So yes. Corey Herzog, Corey, where are you at? Pranked me by signing me up for Christian Mingle. <laughs> he thought it would be hilarious. And I was in the city at the time. It was a Wednesday night. And we lived outside the city in Secaucus. And I was in the city and I get this email notification. Welcome to Christian Mingle. I'm like, what is this? So I go on my email. I go to my profile and my profile was absurd. <laughs> he made what did it he say? absurd. It had every form of music. It had like death metal, heavy rock, disco, wow, techno. Wow, He impressive. put every form of music. Like, <laughs> I'm just into all this music. Um, hobbies. He had, I don't remember the hobbies, but he had the the worst picture of me on there. It was <laughs> it was hilarious. That's so great. So I look That's at this. Prank. I look at this, this dating profile and I immediately know this is Corey. Yeah. Because like, yeah. he would prank me all the time. And so... I call my other roommate or I text my other roommate because the three of us lived in a house and I said, Hey, don't tell Corey, but I know what he did with Christian <laughs> Mingle. So I come home and they're playing FIFA as they always were. And I walk in and I go, guys, you'll never guess what happened to me. And Corey immediately goes, what did you meet someone? And I go, <laughs> yeah, I met my wife <laughs> and I sell him so hard. He's like, no way. So I would go back to my room <laughs> He would be telling Connor, our other teammate, man, I got him so good. Like, but what I did over the next couple of days, I went so, I got so into it 
that Corey started to get like nervous. Yeah. Weren't you like texting Connor, your other yeah. roommate? So I changed, I found a random girl on Facebook. Yeah. I showed Corey. I said, look, this is her. And, and he's like, no way. So I changed Connor's name in my contacts to that girl on Facebook's name. <laughs> And we start texting and Connor would be texting me, be in the same room as us or in the yeah, same car. Yeah. And so That's he would so like be great. reading my mind. I'd say something and then he'd text it as her. That's so And Corey's funny. like, this is incredible. You guys are soulmates. <laughs> so I, I, I played that for days until I finally introduced Connor as, you know, as that girl. And, that uh, is in front so of the, funny. In front of the locker room. That's a good prank. That's a great prank. That's a really great prank because it backfired on him. It backfired. I like but that. But I feel like if, if people listening wanted to use that as a prank i don't know if it'd backfire on everybody so it's yeah. a good and what if it ends up in good. a soulmate you know? yeah it could a i'm glad connection. that that did not work out you know that you didn't I'm like end up on christian mingle yeah. oh we were together it was just funny to to prank Corey. that is awesome that's a good story um, I like it. and then to get him back i put his ipad uh up in the free section of craigslist <laughs> that's fantastic and i put his phone number and his i love it people in the new york metro area his phone would keep dying because people were calling That's and texting so him funny. constantly. That is so funny. Because I just said, hey, free iPad, got a new upgrade. <laughs> Giving this one out. I like it. People That's were sending him pictures sweet. of their kids. Like, my kids would love it. Babies. It oh, was wild. my. That's insane. Those are some good pranks. You are a prankster. I feel like we should, like, talk about that. But this is all about purity, purity culture. culture. We're in a different. So topic. let's shift back. Let's shift back to <laughs> yeah. purity culture. Well, my pranks would get out of hand, but purity culture, because yeah. you said Christian mingle. Yeah. And it really was a Christian mingle before yeah. the internet. I remember hearing about a shindig that somebody put on that was like really all focused on singles coming together to get to know one another. But it was like, like a country style thing. Maybe. Oh really? And it was called a shindig or something like that. Oh wow. If I'm not mistaken. You just, Could so you be didn't mistaken. Go? No, I didn't go. Was like a cowboy outfit required? What was the? Probably so. And they might have even done like line some dancing. sort of line dancing. Yeah. It's great, right? I like it. I'm <laughs> not cow- against it. So Cowboy. Churches are trying to do a good job and say, hey, young people, let's yeah. instead of going to the bars at midnight and trying to find your wife, let's let's hang out with other people who love Jesus. And right. I think it's an awesome it's an awesome idea. Um, yeah. But I think that the purity culture side of it, where it goes wrong is when you start to get weird and you start to like turn everything into a right and wrong of rules. And it really is like, even people in our setting may have said, oh, it's bad to go on Christian Mingle and to do it that way. Where, whereas like others may have been convinced that that was the only way to go about it, you know? Um, And I think that the purity culture setting really was concerned about you not giving your pieces of your heart away to different people. Yeah, that was an interesting phrase. Mm-hmm. So talk about that. Yeah, so they would they like had an, a perspective of if you have you're in a relationship with somebody, then you're going to give a piece of your heart to them and by the time that or even before before you're in a relationship with them, if you like if you like somebody, then if you have this affection or feeling for them um in a very normal way that is giving a piece of your heart away so you have to guard your heart against that and so some people would go to the extreme of saying oh yes well then i almost like need to keep that so at bay and if i'm attracted to this guy oh i I have to push out of my mind because i don't want to give a piece of my heart away so i don't want to like go talk to him i just got to be careful and i think a lot of girls overreacted and would yeah. be so concerned with like not wanting to talk to guys because they were going to give pieces of their heart away to them. And then by the time you come to the altar to get married, they'd be like, oh, I gave this piece of my heart away, this piece of my heart away, this piece of my heart away. And now here, what do I have to give to you? It's like, wow. I have nothing. And it's it's really messed up and warped because that is not how it works. It's like we are we do have attraction And when we are single, that's a way that God has given us to like find a spouse and to like, actually you have to like talk to people to see who you're actually interested in. You can't just ignore that forever and then just like choose somebody, you know, find your soulmate. Yeah. Yeah. So I would imagine, and you tell me with that kind of phraseology of giving your heart away, that that would create a lot of fear Yeah. because you, if you're looking at your heart as this, this you know, pizza for lack of better 
illustration. And it's like, you're giving all these slices out and then you're going to have, you're not going to have any slices left right, for your you're gonna husband. You're going to have like half a slice left for your right. husband. It, it, it would create a terror that you're somehow going to, going to lose aspects of your heart for your soulmate. And then how would you even go into relationships and have a healthy relationship? Is that what you, th do you think that's what drove this idea that you can only date someone if you are almost absolutely set you're going to marry them? Yeah, you can only court somebody. Oh, court someone, yeah. So that's, that is the, the perspective. That's why people were so serious and so focused on, I have to know if I want to be with this person or not. Um, and I think it puts a lot of pressure on the front end of a relationship because yeah. you feel like, oh, I have to have this all figured out right now before I enter a relationship. Otherwise, right. I'm going to give pieces of my heart away to this guy and I won't be able to get that back. And I think that there was there was some sort of grace for like being in a relationship as opposed to like just talking to somebody outside of a formal relationship. I don't know if they thought that protected you or something. Mm -hmm. It was kind of weird, a little superstitious, a little strange. Um, but I think that once you were in a relationship, you felt like, okay, well now I need to like, I, I need to make up my mind. Yeah. But there was so much pressure to be in a relationship before you could even talk to that right. person. Right. Um, and it was so formal. Most of the time right. it would go through the dad before two people could even talk to each other. It goes through yeah. the dad, which I think like, it's great to like talk to someone's dad, you know, at some point, but not even in the initial stages. Cause then sure. there's so much pressure and it's like so formal that you can't really get to know the other person in a normal setting right. as friends. Um, and then move forward into a relationship. And so I think that that really made it difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. And some would like enter relationships and then they would have to break it off. And I don't know what their perspective would have been on that and if they gave pieces of their heart away. But I think that was definitely taught. Yeah. Um, and it was damaging. It's interesting because that phraseology, give a piece of your heart away, there is an aspect of, there's something true that's motivating where, you know, in our culture, people are just with anyone and everyone and it's so indiscriminate and they don't realize the impact of the, the, the negative impact they're making on themselves and mm -hmm. others, uh, especially when you get sexually involved. It's, right. you really are, I mean, that's reserved for marriage, right? right. And so in the Christian setting, wanting to move away from that, mm -hmm. where it is ripping you apart, mm -hmm. all of these loose relationships that you're playing with people's emotions no and bodies and hearts, no yeah. commitment. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. And that doesn't end well. I don't think there's a single, like even secular psychologist who's like, that's the way to go. We yeah. should really be doing that. Like totally. tell your young people just to, um, but, but the reaction to it, of having almost like my heart is this glass bowl. And if at any point gets shattered, it's destroyed. Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't permit for the vulnerability and genuine interest that relationships mm -hmm. demand where to get to know someone really, you've got to, you've got to get in their life and mm -hmm. you've got to be vulnerable to um, open yourself up and even being hurt. Uh, and so it makes it such a, a, a pressurized right. interaction where yeah. it's like, I got to know is, is if this is the person that I could possibly marry, if not, I got to run away. Yeah. And it doesn't allow for just normal relationships to grow, to build. For sure. You know. And I think that going back to what you were saying about just in the culture around us, there there is so much um, like that's messed up with it. And like you said, the lack of commitment, all of that. I think that purity culture and even Christians, let's just say Christians in general, I think that they want to go about things looking for character, looking for that person as um, somebody who's going to be compatible with you, who loves Jesus, right. who has that heart that has been transformed and somebody that they want to be with because of their character and because of the, their attraction to them. So there's both of those things that I think are really good um, because I think you do see around you, there's so much about like, you know, in the world where it's like, okay, well, I'm attracted to you right now, but maybe when, you know, you're old and you're all wrinkled, I'm not going to be attracted to you. So I think that is something that 
the as Christians, we would see and we'd say, okay, well, we want to be faithful to each other. We want to look further than that. We want to get to the character. We want to get to your heart. And that was done well in many ways. But then I think there was an imbalance too on that because then even in some of those settings, they'd be over spiritualized it. It was like, I am, they would downplay attraction attraction. and they would say, I'm just going to marry you because, um, I think your character is great. And then I'll see if attraction comes later. And it's like, Whoa, that's so messed up. Like you need to be attracted to your spouse. Don't over spiritualize this. So I did experience that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Um, in one church setting I was in where they would quote the, the, the proverb, um, Beauty is beauty is vain. Uh, no, beauty favor is, is deceitful. Beauty is yes. vain. But a woman who fears, fears, fears the, Lord the Lord will be, be praised. praised. Yeah, which is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's saying right. it's saying what you just said. There's an aspect of the physical isn't always going to be this way. Right. You, you, we get older, and what really shines through in the soul of a person mm-hmm. is their character and their love for Christ, and that makes someone beautiful on such a more profound, deep level than the the tone of their skin or the wrinkles or Mm-hmm. whatever physical attributes um there's there's a depth and a beauty to humanity that's holistic and it's not purely uh superficial physical attraction um but the overreaction to that then is quoting that verse and saying therefore there's no demand to be attracted there's no requirement yeah. to be attracted and you're actually carnal not spiritual if you're so focused and caught up on this attraction look just look at that person they're look godly at their heart yeah look at their heart and you're like you but should... what about their hair <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> i like that look at their heart what about their hair we should quote you on that that's a good quote <laughs> uh but it's true it's it's I, I mean i had those conversations where people say don't yeah. be superficial yeah and my response was always no I, i'm not trying to be superficial i just mm-hmm. haven't met my wife yet and when i met her i knew oh <laughs> but even in scripture, like I often point to a very interesting and kind of strange passage. I think it's Ezekiel 24. Someone can fact check me on that, but it's when Ezekiel's wife dies and Mm -hmm. Ezekiel was a prophet to Israel. And God actually says to Ezekiel about his wife that she would be taken, that she would die. And he calls her the desire of his eyes and the delight of his soul. Mm -hmm. And for God to be describing Ezekiel's life partner as someone who delighted his eyes and gave him a desire in his soul Mm -hmm. is really beautiful. And then of course you look at the song of Solomon, which is talking about human romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a a delight and a desire and attract attractiveness, attractiveness, Mm -hmm in their relationship that's a necessary component to a romantic relationship Mm -hmm. it's not everything right because those things like you know it's like you will have um like if something goes wrong with the other person you know you're not able to be all that you were when you first got married it's like well no i love you because of who you are yeah and i promised to love you through you know, good times and bad. And so I think that's the commitment is still there, but it, you want to have that. Like initially, I think it's a God given desire to like want to be attracted to your spouse. It is. And to enjoy it. It, Absolutely. It's a gift. But here's something that our culture doesn't understand is the standard of beauty Mm. then becomes your spouse. Mm -hmm. So when I committed my life to you and you committed your life to me, we became each other's standard of beauty where Mm -hmm. I don't look at you and compare you to other women and say, Hey, Ginger, um, can you be attractive like these other women? Mm -hmm. Like, look at this standard. You know, you are my standard of beauty. And so Mm -hmm. now, I mean, that's a command in scripture to delight myself in my wife and her beauty. That's in the song of songs as well. And it, I'm called to look at you and go, okay, now she is what I find beautiful. Mm -hmm. You are what I find radiant. And there's so many, implications of that which are great one of them being um it it gets us out of this rat race of having to uh go okay i've got to be more attractive mm-hmm. than this person or that person i've got to really uh keep my spouse's attention or they're going to leave me mm-hmm. now that's not an excuse to let yourself go right, right. that's right. another none of us want to do love. that but it's like right. 
Yeah, I think that that is a good balance too because I think that in the world around us, that's what's screaming at us Mm -hmm. is to keep up, to be like this, you know, to keep having surgeries, to like try to look as young as possible. And I think that that pressure is, it is there. Um, But then focusing back on the reality and realizing no, that's not what I want to focus on. That's not what I want to run after. I want to be beautiful. Like I want to keep myself up. But I also realize like there are times where there are seasons of life, you know, like after I had the kids, I was like, I didn't feel beautiful. Like I just felt like not myself, you know, and it takes you some time to like get back to feeling normal. But you were always so sweet to like help me through that and help me think rightly through it because it's hard whenever we see so much pressure in the culture around us to be a certain way, to look a certain way. Um, and, and your concern <clears throat> for your own health and physical um, appearance isn't driven by a deep insecurity of, mm-hmm. oh man, I have to stay this way in order to keep my husband exactly. in love yeah. with me or yeah. some, which is, which drives a lot of people sadly. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah. it, what a place of insecurity to be driven by this insecurity, even with someone who's covenanted their life to you. Mm-hmm. And you're driven by this insecurity of, I've got to keep up with these other women mm-hmm. in order to keep his attention or... Yeah. But the other reality is in marriage, and this is something I don't think a lot of young people hear, but as your spouse, and for my case, my wife, so speaking as a man with my wife, becomes your standard of beauty, the, the scars of life that come from living life together, having children, mm-hmm. growing old together, become marks of beauty mm-hmm. because it's like it's like a, a warrior on the battlefield mm-hmm. who uh, has has you know been wounded as he's fought for the freedom of his nation. Those scars become something beautiful because mm-hmm. you say, look, that that was that was that soldier's valiance and courage, and as they've gone through life and have fought for their nation. Well, the same thing with a husband and a wife. Mm-hmm. It's like as we grow old together, it's like yeah, you get older and. And, you know, I'm, I'm a shadow of the man I was 15 years ago. Uh, but there's there's something that's beautiful in that and as you grow deeper. older together. And even just like I'm thinking about your grandparents. It was so sweet seeing them like in their they were in their 90s. Yeah. And your grandmother just passed away like recently. But um, just seeing them together and they had been married for s- how many years? 70? Yep. Over 70. Over 70 years. Yep. They had been married. And they were just like so sweet to each other, dancing together in the living room as long as your grandma could walk, you know, she was dancing with grandpa and they would be like, oh, this is our song. You know, it was just so sweet because they were wrinkled. They were not getting around very well. Grandpa was serving grandma in every way. Like, and it was just really sweet to see how they loved each other so much. And um, they had that bond. Like, even though they were so much older, I'm like, "Ah, that's where we want to be, you know. If, if we're able to yeah. live till we're 90 something, you know, that would be so sweet. We, we called my grandma Maga because uh, when, when she first had grandkids, they weren't able to pronounce grandma. They pronounced it Maga. And yeah. so on her little Volkswagen Beetle, her license plate, uh, well, she had it a special Maga. license plate, Maga, M-A-G-A. And then in 2016, when, <laughs> when Trump won the election... <laughs> And there was all this division over MAGA. She had to get her license plate changed because people would say things to her. Yeah. <laughs> she was driving around town. Crazy. And she couldn't explain to everybody. She's no, like, no, what? Was- That's my name. <laughs> that was my name before he was ever a thing. So. Man, what a fun memory. Yeah. My grandma. Um, so great. But that's so true. There's something, and there's something, I think that every person, it resonates with every person, the beauty of recognizing you are more than your physical appearance. Mm-hmm. Our culture doesn't tell you that. Yeah. That's not how we treat each other out in the world so often. Mm-hmm. So much is predicated upon the external beauty. Mm-hmm. Or what you have and what, you possess. what status yeah. you're in. Instead but of as like Christians, looking. we're not discounting physical beauty. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, you, you mentioned a minute ago, keeping up with yourself. It's like, yeah, there's a there's a mandate in scripture to be healthy and to, to not be a glutton. Yeah, to not <laughs> you know? be a glutton. I mean, there's commit. So yeah. this isn't like, oh, whatever. You you know, your husband covenanted to you. Your wife said, sh- till death do us part. So just don't worry about it. No, no, that's not loving mm-hmm. to yourself yeah. or to others. Uh, but there's a love and an attraction 
that's predicated on something deeper than the physical. Yeah. And I think that's something the purity culture was after. They wanted that. They wanted mm -hmm. to show young people that. And what a great message. But the way they went about it was wrong because it was with all these mm -hmm. rules which basically lost the heart of yeah. what they were going for. So a lot of kids who grew up in that, they saw just a list of rules of things that we can and can't do. Yes. And if they you know, wanted to get in a relationship, it would be like, no, you can't do that. You can't date. You can't go out by yourselves. You have to stay. You know, you have to do courtship. You have to have a chaperone there at all times. You can't kiss before you're married. You can't hold hands before you're engaged. You, you know, have to wear skirts only if you're a girl. Like all these things they would put on you as um, a lot of uh, kids may have seen that as like a biblical command, even sure. though it wasn't. Um, but they were trying to set safeguards around them. That way they would not fall into sin or right. temptation. They were like, okay, if we can keep you as far away from this, then basically you don't even need the spirit of God to keep you as right. a believer. If if you are abiding by these rules, this is enough. And yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of the kids who, um, who grew up in that, a lot of them would buck against it. They'd push against their parents and then they would be called out as rebellious right. if they chose to do anything differently. Even if they were trying to like, honor God right. and what they were doing, I think that they were quickly pushed out as like, well, you're not doing it right. God's way. Right. Yeah. The call for purity, sexual purity is a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's first Thessalonians four. Let me pull it up. Actually. Um, the text it's, it's kind of like the paramount text for first Thessalonians four, three, this is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body and holiness and honor not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. It's a heavy text. Mm -hmm. And it's a call to purity. Not just sexual purity, but definitely including sexual purity, mm -hmm. where it, this, is, this is a matter of love for one another, um, to regard one another in, or to, to care for one another in purity. But when, when we think we can achieve that purity by just slapping a few rules on our life, mm -hmm. we've missed the heart of pursuing purity in yes. all of the Christian life, mm -hmm. which is not, it's, I think you, you called it out as legalism, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it is. It's like you're trying to slap a rule on it and say that's enough. But right. ultimately at the end of the day, to glorify God, you need to, love him, obey him and do what he says in his word. I think the, the confusing thing for a lot of kids was like, well, is this the word of God or is this like yeah. a man-made rule? So that's where purity culture went wrong mm -hmm. was dictating minute details on how to achieve purity mm -hmm. as law. Yeah. And so there was the confusion of, because scripture doesn't talk about courtship. Mm -hmm. scripture doesn't talk about holding hands scripture doesn't talk like back a lot of them would take it from back in the old days you know it's like back in biblical days where it was like even cultural things that they would do and they would like go pick a spouse for somebody or right. like some families would go to that extreme because wow. they were like this is biblical because right. it's in the bible and right. they wouldn't even think about it being like something that was done in that culture or in that setting at that time right um, so it's interesting. Well, if we're trying to get our dating cues from ancient Near Eastern, Middle Eastern culture, we're going to be in a different world. Because if we went back to Bible times to look at how they did relationships, their culture is something we can't relate to as Westerners in America mm -hmm. in the 21st century. So it, it's it, to try to go to the Bible and read it as here's let's find some rules for dating. You're reading it wrong. We need to find a well. We need to go to the well. Yeah, we need to send our servant to the well. We need to, to bring well. camels. Find the first attractive woman yeah, and bring her back. Yeah, to feed. Yeah, like Genesis 24. Yeah. So what we do see, though, is like 1 Timothy 5, Paul, an older man, tells Timothy, a younger man, mm -hmm. treat the sisters in the Lord in all purity. Treat the younger woman, I'm sorry, in all purity as sisters. He's calling him to, hey, love them, regard them, care for them, be mm -hmm. pure in your thought, in your behavior toward them. That's a clear biblical that's a way to love them. Mm -hmm. But what he doesn't do is say, now here's 14 rules. Right. Because what that does is it has an appearance of wisdom. Like, hey, just follow these rules and you'll be pure. It actually doesn't do anything in the heart. Yeah. 
which is why you just said you saw so many people buck against the rules and the impurity of their heart came through Mm -hmm. no matter how many rules you put on them. And I think the scary thing was too, is like seeing so many of these kids who would go through that, they would go through all the rules and they would like, you know, try to do everything just so as it was prescribed in purity culture. And then it was like, at the end of the day, you were thinking, okay, we've been with the chaperone every time we've been together. Do you have self-control outside of that? So I think you kind of lost seeing who that person was because it was so sheltered, it was so prescribed, and it was this perfect yeah. setting. If they and then, followed the rules, they were good. Yeah, and so like I think you can't see if that person has enough self control to to constrain, like to hold themselves I mean, I re- back. I remember telling you, if I can't take you to Subway to grab a sandwich on a Tuesday at one o'clock in the afternoon, and I can't without not controlling myself, you shouldn't marry me. Right. Like I don't have right. self control. Mm-hmm. If if yeah. you and I are sitting here going, we want to be pure and honor God, and I can't do that. Mm-hmm. there's something deeply broken that I need to deal with before pursuing a relationship with you. Right. And so having structures set up that prevent me mm-hmm. um, can be helpful. Like, like there's some things where it's like, okay, if you're going to be, you know, hanging out in each other's apartments till right. like right. late in the night, it's like, well, maybe that's not wise, yeah. but they're like, you can, each person I think will know what's, what's right, right and wrong. Right. And like, and that's the part that was missing. It was like, right. it's it's this way. You have to follow these rules or you are not walking with God and right. you're not honoring God. And the rules weren't coming out of scripture. They were coming out of this culture mm-hmm. that had defined them. Um, so it's interesting. I, I look back at purity culture. I'm grateful for a lot of what it, what it showed us in terms of um, the motivation in, in bringing young people to a desire to be pure. Right. And to um, like have some sort of yeah, commitment and not totally. just to like play around. Yeah. Like I, I get it yeah. on that side of things. I see like our producer, J-Rod, he just got a purity ring and him and his buddies are committed to purity. Mm-hmm. And I look at that and I go, here's a, here's a young guy who loves Christ. He's living for Jesus. He wants to love others mm-hmm. and he wants to commit himself to, to ha- conducting relationships in a way that glorifies God. That's amazing. That's a pr- the pursuit of purity. Um, but it's without the legalistic structures around it of, Mm -hmm. okay, here's 42 rules that you must follow if you want to honor God. Right. That's a young man going, Hey, Paul told Timothy walk in purity with the young women. So I'm going to do that too. Yeah. Like that's, that's just love. That's Mm -hmm. the law of Christ to love one another. And so we want to promote that and we want to encourage that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to encourage the, you know, the free, you know, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. what you do with your heart. No, that, that has effects. And I mean, that's been proven. We've seen, we, mm-hmm. we, we know that. Um, but but we, we don't want to overreact to our mm-hmm. culture within the church and run into the legalistic structures of a man-made system where we go, okay, Ginger, you and I, let's come up with 20 rules and let's impose that on the students we minister among. And that's the path to godliness. Yeah. Because you can't, Mm-hmm. actually attain godliness that way it has to be motivated from a heart that loves god and loves others um we we counsel people all the time who are young people in, in relationships um how would you counsel a, a young woman who's saying i want to be married um i don't know where to start um you know i i've i've haven't found a guy who who seems to love God. Like where 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 do you start with with a young person? Because I mean, you have those conversations a lot. I know I do too. Yeah, I think it's I think like it's so interesting. There's so many places where nowadays people can meet. You know, somebody that is on the same page as them, somebody who is running after Christ as hard as they are. And I think like like you said, even at some points, you'd be like, oh, I just haven't met my wife yet. Yeah. I think that there is a certain level of that where um, you'll just know. Like I had guys around that wanted to get to know me, but I, di- I wasn't in that same place. Like maybe at one time I was, and then by the time they were attracted to me, I wasn't attracted to them. And like God was working all that out too because I just didn't see anybody who was at this certain like – not level, but like this certain commitment and love for God that yeah. I wanted to see in them. And I think once I met you, then I was like, oh, this just makes sense. Like, I feel safe with you. I want to get to know you better. And there was a certain like, you know, thing that just clicks. And I think for 
young people today, like it can be so hard because there yeah. are so many who are not running hard after Christ. And there are so many who are just so distracted with things of the world around them. And it's hard to find um, somebody who's like-minded. And like you said, we've had friends who have met people through Christian Mingle. People have met um, through friends or at their church. Sure. And so I think that you can't, there's no like perfect recipe for like how to meet somebody. Um, but just to like be serving the Lord, yeah. to be loving the Lord where you are, where you're called right now. And that doesn't mean like, oh, if there's, you know, like I have to stay in this certain place because I'm single, I can't like ever put myself out there, um, to be like, you know, found by other young men. Yeah. Like, I think that was something that was like, kind of look down upon is like sit yeah. around and wait for who God has for you yeah. and God will bring him along. And then you're like getting older and older and older. And it's like, well, God hasn't just brought him yet. And it's like, right. well, you live in the middle of nowhere. Right. You're not getting out. You're not trying to meet anybody. And so I think some of that is like, you need to be pursuing, like if you want to be married, then you need to be able to be in a place where there's going to be a young man who will be there. So like, it's like swim in a bigger pond. It's pursuing a patience. Like I hear you saying, you know, be patient. Be content. You, yeah, be content. If you haven't met, if yeah. you haven't met him, Don't you haven't be met desperate. Him. Like when I was like, people were telling me, you know, why aren't you married? I'm like, because I met my wife. And then when I meet her, I'll marry her, you know. But then at the same time, not just sitting in a corner and closing your eyes and, and saying, I'm waiting for God to bring my yeah. spouse to me. Cause like, I, how do you I've also seen him? that yeah. and it's, it's not been the best right. idea and thought process. And so I think just serving the Lord, being diligent, um, putting yourself in a place right. where you'll meet other people is, yeah. is good. I think that's good. I think for, uh, in our context, that means getting into a local church, being part right. of a good local church, actively serving mm -hmm. and not, not don't, don't go in there like, like a house hunter, you know, mm -hmm. like looking for all the prospects, just, just be focused on the church, but also do life in community. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge emphasis that, uh, I think has been really good in our ministry of, um, both for single people, but people in relationships of doing all of life in community. Mm -hmm. So you're not isolated. You're not alone. And when you're in that community, you find people who are running after Jesus like you are. Yeah. And you, you begin to get to know people on a genuine level where it's not a superficial thing like a weekend retreat for singles where mm -hmm. it's kind of like, hey, this is forced and every conversation is a prospect conversation. And I can only imagine how that would have gone down. No, it's just life in community where you're mm -hmm. getting to know people, you're living life alongside people and those relationships happen organically. Super cool. Like even in college ministry right now, we're experiencing that. You Ginger, see I am doing so, so many, many weddings. So many weddings this year. <laughs> he has so many weddings. I think I have five this summer. Or more. Yeah, maybe like more. Like it's almost more. Because he has, yeah, he has a lot. Um, it's really cool. Like students are, um, they're, you know, almost done with college. They're like right. getting married because they like met each other and where they were, you know, learning about Jesus together. Yeah, a lot of them and have just relationships for the last yeah, five, six, seven fun. years. It was really cool. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, they're they're finding their uh, husbands, finding their wives. Um, so it's that's encouraging. I think uh, it's good to it's good to see that. And I I think for the church to promote not this culture of hey, this is how we do dating mm -hmm. or courtship, which I think is so easy for churches to fall into, where you come in and you almost go, okay, so what's, is, what's what are the, the taboos here? here? What's the what culture here? What are we not allowed here? to do? What are we yeah. not allowed to say? And I don't like that. I, yeah. I just let people live. Let let Christians live. Let people pursue Jesus. You want to ask that that girl out to grab a coffee? Go do it. And mm -hmm. you know, some of our listeners are going to be like, yeah, what's wrong with that? It's actually I've been mm -hmm. in settings where. I've told a guy, hey, yeah, you like her? Go ask around for coffee. And it's like, no, 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 no. I could never do that. Right, right. You're like, what do you mean you could never do that? It's like, yeah. no, no, that's taboo here. Yeah. It's like, what are we doing? What are, what yeah, are, we're making what are we... it so weird. Everything yeah. becomes like weird. <laughs> I like that word, weird. That's a, that's a good word, weird. You use that word a lot, and I like it. So I learned <laughs> that word in seminary. Um, it was, I, I, I hadn't employed it much before then. Yeah. But uh, just learning to recognize that there's a lot of weird stuff, and you don't have to get involved in all the weird stuff makes life a lot simpler it does so let's not be weird about dating yeah come on churches let's be uh let's just let people live you know yeah that's good 
That's help. That's helpful. What else, where else are we going on this? Any any other? Oh, you know what I wanted to talk about, Ginge. Uh, you brought it up before, and you've brought a lot of wisdom in this episode. I'm excited for people to hear it. I, the role of parents, because I think in our society now, I don't want to speak for our society. Some guys are like quick to speak for the whole culture, but I do think the role of parents has been downplayed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, for sure. But then I think you experienced somewhere it was like the gatekeepers were the parents and it's like, man, I can't even get to know someone without parent involvement. Mm -hmm. So, okay, maybe that was a little more, a lot of people, you know, the 50 page questionnaire I got, which mm -hmm. I actually appreciate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't mind that, you know, and a lot of people have never heard of something like that. I hadn't either when I got it, but looking back, it really caused a lot of great conversations with you and me. Yeah. The questionnaire your dad had, had given us. But how how do we balance that of, you know, what is, because scripture doesn't talk about that either. It doesn't say, hey, if you're interested in, a, in dating someone, you've got to talk to their parents. Mm -hmm. But w where do you fall in the wisdom of that and involving parents? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, I haven't really thought too much about that. And I think like I appreciate the honoring of the parents where it's like, okay, they have poured into you so much. And so hearing their wisdom, I think is, is good. And it also shows them that you care about them and honor them. Um, and then at the same time, I think that there can be an imbalance in that as well of like having to have them vet their relationship so intensely at the beginning. Like you said, before you've even get, you've even had a chance to like talk to that person, get to know if you would even be interested in them. Um, then I think it can make things too formal initially to like have the parents, like you have to meet my parents before you have to ask for their permission before right. we can even talk. I think that that formalizes things and can also scare away, you know, potential suitors. And I think like if it's the right person, I don't think that they're going to like run away necessarily. Maybe they will. I don't know. But, um, at the same time, I think it's just it in the purity culture, it became such a thing to like, well, you have to have this approval. You can't go out to mm -hmm. coffee just to get to know this person initially. Right. And then later, like say, hey, like mom and dad, like what do you think about them? What do you think about this person? And like take their advice. And right. I think even in Bill Gothard's setting, the issue was he would say, oh yeah, if your parents, if your parents are unbelievers and they, they like meet your significant other and they say, hey, we don't like him. I don't think you should marry him. And they're like, why? And he says, because, you know, he loves Jesus or whatever. Well, then you're not allowed to marry right. them. And I think that was so warped because right. then you have, well, these people don't love Jesus and you love Jesus right. and you want to marry this person. And so I think having counselors, having people around you, I think it's wise to listen to those in your life who know you best, who are on the same page as you. So if you have somebody who you really trust, Go to them and ask them, what do you think right. about this person? Do you see them as like being who they say they are? And I think right. that's smart and that's wise. Um, but when it comes down to like the parents as having the final say in everything, I think that that is damaging. Yeah. It can be, it can be a, a, a little bit imbalanced. Right. Yeah. I, I appreciate wanting to honor parents. I tell young men, yeah. if you're interested in a girl, talk to the dad. I mean, yeah. at, at some point doesn't have to be the first thing you do, but yeah. even if the dad's like, whatever, dude, why are you asking me? It it shows them, hey, I respect you. I respect mm -hmm. your role. I respect who you are. And I think it shows uh, the person you're interested in, like, wow, they, they have regard for mm -hmm. people in my life. You yeah. know? So I don't think there's a downside to it. Right, for sure. Um, even even when they're like, oh, my dad doesn't care. It's like, well, yeah, but I want to show him that I do, you know? Right. So I respect that. I think it just needs to be uh, done in the right way. Done the right way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's good. That's good wisdom, Ging. Uh, you chair. You've got okay. you've got a lot a lot of good input. I'm glad you're in the lives of a lot of these uh, young people we minister to, because I so think you, you bring balance and, and wisdom. Oh, thanks. Uh, guys, thanks for listening to the pod. If you want to follow along, subscribe. If you're on YouTube, we are on. Somebody on Instagram said, "Can you please get on Amazon Music?" So I've never listened to anything on Amazon Music. I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. Are but we very podcasts. old? Are we old, Jay? No, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't <laughs> know if it's the the Gen A. Are we in Gen A now? So the we're on Amazon Music, so you can subscribe there. We're on Spotify, obviously. We're on Apple Music. We're on all sorts of podcast platforms, um, and we're now on TikTok. We're on TikTok.
Isn't that crazy? That's insane. The podcast is on TikTok. There we go. I thought TikTok was shutting down, but apparently not. So <laughs> uh, check it out on TikTok. We appreciate you guys for listening. We'll see you next time.